when I think about Steiner's importance, uh, maybe three areas strike me as of most continuing importance, at least given my concerns. Uh, one would be the, the place of the human being in Steiner's imaginative vision, uh, the cosmological aspects of Steiner's vision and providing a much larger, wider, uh, and more immediately more immediately resonant vision of what the cosmos involves. And uh, I suppose the third would be, um, the third would be Steiner's account of uh, the evolution of consciousness and how that situates uh, human life and activity today and gives a kind of way of looking back and understanding, imaginatively entering, entering into an understanding of previous times and epochs. Um, so the first one, uh, the role of the human being is I think it's one of these continuing questions in the modern world, right? So we find ourselves, we discover ourselves in modernity suddenly cut off from places of centrality that we used to have. And one likes to talk about the various uh, decenterings of the human being with Copernicus and Darwin and Freud and so forth. But Steiner provides a way of thinking through the human being's importance that doesn't undo any of those moments, doesn't rely upon a, an illusory picture of ourself that's been falsified by science or something like that, but still thinks the role of the human being as of fundamental cosmic and even theological importance. Right? So the human being becomes a site in which the entirety of the cosmos is flowing into and uh, being transfigured and flowing out of. Uh, the, and Steiner's word for this is oftentimes Sophia or wisdom. Uh, and I think this is part of the reason for the, the very name of Steiner's um, organization, that it's, it's Sophia, it's the Sophia of the Anthropos. It's anthropos anthroposophy. It's the wisdom of the human being as the site of this extraordinary cosmic cauldron of transfiguration moral responsibility uh, and creative activity, right? So, um, so I, I, when I think about, when I approach someone like Steiner, it's always hard to know how much of this, you know, I'm supposed to take absolutely seriously because there, there are some extraordinarily wild claims that he makes. And it's not always clear, I'm a philosopher by training, so it's not always clear where the where the authority for some of these claims comes from. And yet, the, the fecundity of his imagination, just the, the richness and the, the life of the picture he presents, I find so compelling uh, for thought. Right? It allows a new, it allows, it's almost like, um, I don't want to say that I approach Steiner as, as a as a poet only, uh, you know, it's not just pretty pictures that one can feel good about, but uh, there is this kind of rich, energizing force to the expansiveness of his vision, and, and this centrality of the human being, I think, relates to it. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking of, um, there's a, everyone knows the, the story of Prometheus, right, who stole fire from uh, the gods. Prometheus himself was a god. He was a titan. Uh, but we don't talk quite as often about his brother Epimetheus. So Epimetheus, Prometheus means forethought or foreknowledge. Epimetheus uh, means afterthought or uh, um, uh, yeah, afterthought. Or he's oftentimes in, in Greek mythology, Epimetheus is often kind of the fool figure. So Prometheus thinks things through ahead of time. He knows things ahead of time. Epimetheus only knows things after he does them. And in that way, he's kind of a paradigm also, I think, of contemporary empiricism or sort of material knowledge where you only know things by doing it after the fact. Uh, and in, in this story, Epimetheus and Prometheus, the titans, they're given the task of finding different 
skill sets, different gifts to give to each being in creation. And Epimetheus says to Prometheus, how about I go through and assign them and then you check my work, right? So Epimetheus starts handing out these various gifts, these various talents to all the beings of creation. And he gives to the, he gives to the elephant a thick skin and tusks and he gives to tigers teeth and speed and so forth. And he's going through and he's doing a great job doing this. And he's very excited and he gets to the end, to the, the being that Prometheus himself is most excited about, to the human being, and he's exhausted all of his resources. There's nothing left to give to anyone. Uh, and so this is a real crisis because he hasn't thought it through ahead of time. He's used everything he's got. Uh, and this is what prompts Prometheus then looking at the naked, hairless biped, right, with nothing. This is what prompts Prometheus to sneak into uh, the dwelling of Hephaestus and Athena and to steal both fire and the arts, right, and to give those to the human being. So that's, but what I think is going on in, in that story beyond just where did humans figure out how to build things or use fire or something like that, uh, you can look at it in two ways. One, there's the question of would the cosmos be incomplete without the human being, right? If everything's been assigned to all the other creatures before you get to the human being, is the cosmos just complete without us? Is there any need for us to be here? And I think that's one of, that's one of these questions that we're saddled with in the last three centuries of our existence, where we've begun to wonder, why are we here? What do we add? Uh, the other way you can ask the question, though, is you can ask, uh, what is the specific talent of the human being? What is our gift? What is our essence? And the way, what, what the story, I think, is partially pointing to, at least this is the way that Pico de, de la Mirandola read it, is the story is pointing to the way that the human being is, the gift of the human being is to be, to be spirit, to be capable of anything. Capax universi, Pico says. Uh, and I think that's very much at the heart of Steiner's vision also, that the human being is, he's, he or she is not the crown of creation because he or she is to lord over creation or to rule it, but as being most open to the entirety of intelligible beings. All right, as most open to a kind of intimacy and friendship with everything from the cosmic hierarchies to the lowest, uh, simplest, uh, most beautiful elemental beings and animal beings. Every one of those gets brought into what the human being is, recapitulated and finds a home in the wisdom that the human being holds. So that, that part of Steiner's vision, I think, is both in deep continuity with lots of the most profound aspects of the Western tradition, and it's extraordinarily compelling. I, I, for me, at least, I find it gives me a way of thinking through who we are and what we're called to that doesn't, doesn't, latch, doesn't force me to latch myself to modes of thought that have been, that we can't hold any longer. I mean, there's nothing we've learned that that forces that vision of the cosmic human being, the, what they, in the ancient church they used to call the, the amphibious being, the being that dwells, unlike anything else, dwells both fully in the animal material realm and in a, a realm of intelligibles, intelligences and spirits, and uh, the, this frontier being that's capable then of recapitulating it all within himself or herself. Jake, is, is, is what you're saying, is that what was always understood as the human being a microcosm of the macrocosm then, is that? Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, that's, uh, although I, I think Pico and then Steiner drawing on this great sort of renaissance and esoteric notion of the human being reads it perhaps wider than much of the tradition read the microcosm and macrocosm. But Gregory of Nyssa already had this notion of the human being as, again, kind of Kapok's universe, capable of the entire universe and recapitulating it all in himself or herself. Uh, you find a lot of it in antiquity where, where people are, they're, they're concerned to ask this question in a way that maybe we aren't so much. Um, 
to, to know what, what is it about us. Yeah. I think we tend to assume we know what it, what it is about us that's special. Uh, and, and oftentimes, in a kind of way that seems more like Epimetheus than Prometheus, we think what's special about us is we look around at all the things we make, the kind of power we exert, uh, our capacity to meld things according to our will. Whereas this other vision sees it much more as uh, what's special about us resides in our capacity for intimacy with everything. Right? It's not a question of the exertion of the will so much as it's a question of the expansion of our friendship uh, and our capacity to take inside us uh, what exists. Um, in, in, in Steiner, or at least some of the interpreters of Steiner who've been influential upon me, I think maybe you could say that rather than the will being given this absolute priority the way modernity does, it's actually something more like the imagination which mixes both heart and mind, which mixes will and intellect, uh, and brings all of those together. And so the imagination is capable of holding inside ourselves that which is, to all other appearances, outside of ourselves. Uh, so, Why don't you think that we ask those questions nowadays about what are we, where have we come from, that's uh, what, what, a, what a great question. Um, I'll say sort of a, in the first place, it seems to me that we are bewitched by our own achievements. Um, I, it's, ext it's hard to ask a lot of these questions when we dwell in things that we've already shaped, right? I mean, to go back to this question of the will's power uh, to force itself upon the world. When I live in a city where all I see are rectangular lines and straight edges, and the trees I see outside have all been planted there and they're kept by the city, right? So I don't encounter a, I don't encounter in, immediate, in an immediate way, intelligences that we haven't shaped or generously allowed to be there. And that, I think, shuts down a lot of these questions. They don't arise as easily. That's one of the reasons why I think if you go out uh, and go climb mountains or live in a tent on a, and go camping or something like that, uh, these kind of conversations happen more, more spontaneously in that, that sort of a place. Um, Steiner had a theory about uh, the evolution of consciousness that also provides some explanation for why perhaps we don't answer these questions uh, or ask these questions so much today. Steiner thought that human, I was going to say human consciousness, but even human being itself, uh, the, the fullness of who we are is not static. It's not given once for all in the past, uh, but has been changing and transforming the extent of its relationship or the extent of its participation with other sorts of realities and energies. So uh, in the modern period, he thinks we've come to a place where our attention is much more fixated on external realities. And in a certain sense, external realities have become much more real than they used to be. Their, their edges are harder. Their surfaces are less porous. Uh, and it's not just that our way of thinking about it has changed. Because our way of thinking isn't confined to my skin. It's part of the world itself. So if our way of thinking and engaging with this world has changed, there's a certain sense in which the relationships of the world themselves have changed. And so the world itself has actually changed, become more solid. Uh, and in that historical moment where we find ourselves much more when we reflect, you know, I find myself in a body and it's harder for me to think of myself as dwelling beyond the confines of this body 
than I think it was for some of my predecessors. Uh, so those questions are raised with much greater difficulty when our imagination, when our felt experience of the world is more alienated uh, now. And that's not entirely a bad thing. It's not, I, I don't want to suggest a kind of naive romantic vision that would say, well, if only we could get back to a time when we're purely porous, uh, how great that would be. I mean, there's a certain thrill to that, I'm sure. There's a kind of whooshiness, a, a feeling of ecstasy that is associated with that. But there's a lot of downsides to that also in terms of lack of autonomy and also rigidity of, of structures. If you feel the entire universe as suffused with meaning uh, and don't feel centers of meaningful agency within yourself capable of shaping that, uh, then the status quo is going to be oftentimes experienced as legitimated, not just by the city or by your community, but by the very universe itself, which I think is one of the reasons why in the ancient world these uh, structures and social relationships and polities, why they persist so, so long, why, and why it's so hard to imagine deep structural change to them, whereas we, in the last three or four hundred years, we're constantly imagining structural change. We're imagining structural change in economics, in politics. It's one of the marks of, of the modern world, and I, I think part of Steiner's vision is to see that as an achievement, right? That we, uh, that human being, that, that wisdom or spirit had to do this process of moving from the periphery to the center and concentrating its intelligence, its consciousness, in centers that feel themselves, as we feel ourselves, to be, to a certain extent, cut off from these outside forces. And that would be just a pure story of, maybe, of, of modernity or a pure story of disenchantment if that's where it ended if the end game was just to become an isolated atomic individual. Um, but what Steiner provides and what uh, some of Steiner's interpreters uh, have elaborated as well is that we have no reason to suspect that that's the end game. In fact, there are lots of hints, suggestions, readings of the world that we can do uh, that point us to something beyond this isolated atomic individuality with its gifts of liberty and democracy and uh, creative agency. But that one way we might use that newfound liberty, that newfound creative agency, is actually to reestablish our connections with the world. Not to thereby lose our agency, but to actually use that imaginative capacity for intimacy with all things, uh, to have a kind of moral fire in the imaginative heart. Do that, you think that's happening? Well, I think I, the optimist in me would love to say, I am a very optimistic person by nature, so I'd love to say, yeah, I can see all sorts of reasons. And I, I run into people all the time who are engaging in that. But I, whether that's happening on a widespread scale, whether that's going to, uh, Novalis has this phrase that is, very resonant with Steiner. Novala says, uh, man is the messiah of nature. Uh, and it's this kind of a vision that I think he's talking about, that this new imaginative re-enchantment proceeds through the human being. Whether that's actually happening the way that the romantics imagined it would is not clear to me uh, on a wide scale. But in pockets, it's happening. So the possibility of it happening is there. I don't know that the guarantee of its happening can be read off the surface of events uh, currently. But it's, when you look at, here in North America, you look at this extraordinary rise in people's relationship with the outdoors, with um, what we call the environment or creation. Uh, it, just in the last, it, it's started in the 19th century, this movement towards the outdoors, they, they called it the outdoors movement and uh, the establishment of our parks and wilderness areas and so forth. But then suddenly in, in the last 30 years, 
the intensity with which people began to cultivate these leisure activities outside, hiking and mountain biking and camping and so forth, uh, I think that's a kind of indication of a recognition that part of what we need is a new connection to that which we've cut ourselves off from. Gardening would be another example, wouldn't it? Gardening is a perfect example. Uh, and the attention to foods, attention to slower forms of eating, attention, all of these, um, the slow food movement, the uh, organic and biodynamic movements in agriculture and gardening, uh, farming, I think the new the new agrarianism uh, a new attention to the role of farms and not just large factory farms but farms that involve uh, rhythm with the soil and with what's produced all of these things are they're in our awareness at least in certain cultural spheres um, I I'm also painfully aware of how large the forces of mechanism and mass production and so forth are and how they're not intractable they can be moved but even when they are moved it doesn't seem that we we haven't had any sort of great achievements where we seem to have really won anything more than a skirmish uh, i think it's a very so I'd like, I, I, I'm, there's this, one of Steiner's um, students, uh, extraordinary man named Owen Barfield, a scholar of Coleridge uh, and part of that movement, literary movement of the Inklings with J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and Charles Williams. Uh, Barfield, when he was asked about a similar question, is he hopeful for the future? He said, in, in the short term, I'm a pessimist, but in the long run, I'm an optimist, uh, and I've always found that really true. I think it's hard for me to see us in the next decade or two decades having some sort of wonderful renaissance where we can just let go of our worries. But in the long run, I have confidence that it's not just myself or other human beings alone making these decisions, that we're we're in touch with intelligences that are loving and uh, true that also care for us. And of course, in, in, the, in the Christian West, we talked about uh, this being God's role. And I think that, you know, I, deeply, I deeply know that that's part of our situation, that we're not, we're not making these choices all on our own, but we're being lured uh, to something better than what we are now, and to something that uh, involves grace. So, our thoughts are not often our own, even. I mean, this is when, when I said before that we live in worlds that seem to look just like our will set them up, right? As if, you know, there's these angles, hard angles, and everything we created. If we were to dwell more carefully on our thoughts, and this is one of the things that I, I learned as much from Steiner as from anyone, if we were to dwell more carefully on our thoughts, we'd realize that, in fact, we don't live in worlds of our own creation. My thoughts are not, I, they're misnamed when I call them my thoughts. I, I don't have control of them. Sit and try to Try to monitor your thoughts for a minute or two and watch how many unwilled thoughts enter into your mind. And we still think that they're ours. Uh, but Steiner, uh, he, it's almost like a gestalt shift. He allows you to see that that's not you thinking thoughts you hadn't meant to. That's thoughts, as it were, thinking themselves in you. And we don't own them. Right? There, there are thoughts that get out into the world uh, and have agency, it seems like, of their own. And so they put themselves into our minds. Sometimes they use us to create worlds, perhaps, that they are imagining. 
Uh, and you can discern. I think some of these are more benign and some of these are totally um, ambivalent, immoral, uh, and some of them may be more invidious. They may be more dangerous. I have confidence that in the long run, the benign thoughts <laughs> and the beings that are on the side of the good and the true and the beautiful uh, get the last word. And I suppose that might be just another way for saying I have faith. What do you understand by, by Steiner's phrase, the spiritual world? Because there is a, a tendency, certainly right. in English, for yeah. it to sound as though it's somewhere else. I, one of the things that I think is most extraordinary about Steiner's imagination and Steiner's recapitulation of many of the topics in Western thought that had been there previously but that had been forgotten is the way that he reminds us of what words like spirit have sometimes meant and what they can still mean. Uh, and for Steiner, it's the spiritual world is not just one level. We have, I think, we are partially frustrated in trying to think through these issues because we think that there is the material world in which there's everything that's visible, and then there's a spiritual world, which is as if there was just one on the one hand and then another on the other hand. And then you have this great gap. How do you get from the material to the spiritual, or how do you get from mind to brain, or from body to spirit? All of these questions that we were always wrestling with. Whereas for Steiner, there's a lot of differentiation within the spiritual world itself. The, the visible world is the barest aspect of reality. And then on top of that, there are uh, subtle worlds that include worlds of forms, worlds of intelligences, and worlds of pure spirit, uh, pure luminous uh, existence. So. I don't think of the spiritual world as somewhere else, as if it was a continent that with the right ship I could sail to. I think of it instead as the, the forms, the intelligences, the energies animating the one world that we all dwell in. Uh, now, parts of that world can be more visible to us or less visible to us, depending on our perceptual capabilities and depending on the way we cultivate those perceptual capabilities. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're elsewhere. So an example of a spiritual, a, a spiritual reality would be, I think, the notion of form, the very classical notion of form you find in Plato and Aristotle, for example, that which gives visible shape uh, or meaningful shape or sustains a meaningful pattern in something's existence. That reality of form needn't be thought of as just an accidental accumulation of forces, as if you know the, the form of the human being, as if this was just held together by some sort of mechanical exterior presentation. But uh, in the in classical medieval thought, we said that the the soul is the form of the body, right? so this is what Thomas Aquinas thought. Uh, the soul is the form of the body. It gives it's the soul which actually gives me shape and holds my pattern uh, together. And I think that's how I would be inclined to think of the spiritual world uh, in the first place is oftentimes is that which holds these formal and intelligible meanings, holds these patterns of relationship and manifestation. And there are lots of forms that aren't maybe animal or embodied the way we are, but I would, I would tend to see those as, as maybe even beings themselves, uh, so that uh, a, a corporation or a nation uh, has a certain, if there's something there, if it's not just, if it's not just something that was bundled together, a mere heap, if there's something that really makes it an entity, a nation, a people, a society, a group even, a, a, a club can have this sometimes. Uh, if there's something that really holds it toge together so that it seems to have a life of its own, an identity of its own, 
it seems to me that that's uh, that we need the language of the spiritual world to actually talk about that, uh, and that you know maybe some of our old language of angels or or something relates to how to think about that. Jake, why do you think Steiner isn't better known? I think it was extraordinarily difficult, even in the early 20th century, for Steiner to find the right place for him to do his work. Um, and Steiner, working within the broader currents of theosophy and anthroposophy and these uh, spiritual movements, meant also that Steiner isolated himself uh, and his work from some of the cultural centers that I think continue to channel contemporary life. Uh, so Steiner had a very interesting career in the university before he kind of came out after his 40th birthday as a spiritual teacher. Um, and he continued to publish some works that were more academic in nature, and some that, I mean, his account of Western philosophy, uh, which he published some 20 years after he was doing his spiritual work, is still, I think, really valuable and provides creative, uh, alternative readings of a number of figures that can be really useful when you go back and think about them. But it did mean that a lot of his work was neglected or was seemed to be contaminated, I think, to a lot of the gatekeepers of culture. Not so much artists. Steiner was a big influence on a lot of early 20th century artists, and if you're doing good art history or something like that, you have to pay attention to that. Uh, likewise with education and, and these other fields that he influenced, but the overall picture was so at odds with what the gatekeepers of culture uh, themselves held and probably continue to hold that it's really hard to get to get a hearing for someone you know for someone who talks about gnomes and sylphs and other sort of elemental spirits or atlantis and post atlantean epochs all of these things are are hard to swallow. Even for, you know, I eased my way into Steiner by reading some of his interpreters uh, who don't talk about these things so much. And I still find some of these aspects of Steiner very difficult to know what to do with, right? And, and how they should be interpreted and how they should be read. And um, so that's been, a, that's been a difficulty that confronts him. My, ho my hope is that, uh, my hope is that we can bracket those concerns, not dismiss them, because I think those are real concerns that I at least would want to continue to uphold, but that we don't allow those concerns to sort of write Steiner and his contributions in so many fields off. Uh, I find there's a tremendous amount for us to work with here uh, and to think through, and, and he opens, for me at least, the way that Steiner is most a part of my own thinking is he opens, he opens for me new possibilities that I hadn't considered before, but that are immensely fruitful to pursue. So it's not, I, I don't approach Steiner as an authority, that because he says this, therefore I know it's true. Instead, I see him sort of radically expanding the areas that I can look at. I, before, uh, reading Steiner or, or some of his interpreters, I felt like my vision on the world was much narrower, where now I can open to a, there's a whole number of different areas, all these different rooms I never knew existed that are very much worth thinking about. And some of them I don't know what to do with, uh, and I just let them pass. I'm not all that concerned to try to refute Steiner. I mean, who needs to, right? <laughs> it's, it's not, um, you know, it's not uh, causing any problems. It's not a it's not over, it's not sort of circling the world and getting everybody to believe in this way. So those areas that I don't know what to do with or that I'm dubious about, I'm happy to just 
sort of leave them aside. And then there's areas that I don't know how, how true they are, uh, but I find them interesting. And I, I think about those, and I continue to work with those and see what, what they might mean. And then there are other things that through my own research or through my own experience of the world, uh, maybe Steiner first opened my eyes to see them, or maybe he just articulated them, things that I already knew in a different way that helped me to give language to it. Uh, but there are lots of those areas that I would say I know. Um, and but that's, that's a complex way of reading someone, and that takes a lot more work than if you pick up your average textbook where you're supposed to, you still have to sift through it, but uh, it's a much easier sifting process. Uh, so it's, it's demanding, I guess I would say. It's demanding to work with Steiner and demanding just at that level of what do I do with these various categories of things that I know, things that I'm interested in, and things that I have no idea what to do with. It's also demanding because it asks personal participation. Uh, our title, The Challenge of Rudolf Steiner, is quite good then in this sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's a challenge. It's a challenge to the world because what he presents is so much at odds with some of our governing assumptions. Uh, and many of his differences with our governing assumptions, I think I want to side with Steiner. I think he's saying something we really need to hear and something that holds an immense amount of hope and promise for us. It's a challenge just if you've ever tried to read through Steiner's works, uh, it's a challenge to know how to how to read them even. It's not, I don't think they should be read literally, uh, lots of them. I think oftentimes he uses language in a way that is not, he's not intending us to take that with absolute literalness the way I take an account of uh, one of Napoleon's battles, for example. I'm, I need to engage it differently. And so it's a challenge for me personally or for the reader personally to know not, not even to know, it's a challenge to comport oneself in such a way that what is being spoken about can be understood. It demands, it's a kind of reading that demands our participation. Uh, in academic language we talk about it's a performative text. It's a text that you don't just mimic or read off the pages. It's not just a representation of reality, but it's a text that actually has to do something to you, it does something to the reader, and only in that way is the text finally achieved. So, it's, yeah, it's a challenge. <laughs>